Hey guys, welcome back to Prep Course Sessions on Verbal Ability for CAT. Today we're going to be doing more exercises on reading comprehension. I hope you've seen the last one. In any case, I'll leave a link down below in the description. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to what is a very, very important topic, reading comprehension. As we discussed last time, this is important for multiple reasons. One is it can really give you a competitive advantage over others. This is an area that a lot of people find ambiguous. If you can resolve that, you have a huge advantage over others. Basically by really boosting your accuracy. Secondly, if you're fast in this section, you are saving a lot of time and freeing up a lot of time for other sections and relieving a lot of pressure that could have been on you if you'd basically spent more time here. Also, this section gives you multiple advantages in other sections depending on your exam. If, for example, you have a critical reasoning section, this is a huge, huge boost there. Some of the skills you use here will also be used there. And of course, critical reasoning also involves reading fast. Now the key to remember here, the thing to remember here is this is not an ambiguous section. It is the examiner's job to make sure that there is one correct answer and only one correct answer. If there are two answers which are both equally correct, the whole exam goes for a toss, not just that question. Because the next morning there will be a lawsuit against the exam setters. They'll have to redo the whole exam because one question going wrong means either you give everyone that score, but then it's, it's icky. They don't want to risk that. Therefore, it is the examiner's, the exam setter's job to give you enough and more clues, to sprinkle enough clues through the passage to ensure that there is one and only one correct answer for every question. Your job is to find those clues and find that one correct answer. Now, sometimes there could be two options which are very, very similar. What do you do in that case? Compare those two options and basically see what is the difference between these two options? How do I? And once you know the difference, then go back to the passage, figure out which is the correct answer. The other thing to keep in mind is be very, very specific why a particular answer is right and why all the other answers are wrong. All the other options sounds right or sounds wrong does not cut it. You are doing yourself a disservice if you're doing that. You have to be very specific. This answer is right because it is mentioned on line so and so, line so and so or this answer is wrong because Either it's just not mentioned in the passage. Keep in mind that even if the passage is non-fiction, your answers have to be based purely on what is given in the passage. So one very valid reason for an answer being wrong could just be this is just not mentioned in the passage. Another one could be, okay, then you point out specific lines. The author says this and not this, therefore this is wrong. The point is be very, very, very specific. For every single answer, every single option, why is this right? Why is this wrong? There is no scope for ambiguity in this exam, in this section of the exam for sure. So we're going to do a couple more practice passages this time. And the key is not just to do these passages. The, the, the aim here is to look in depth at what is the process of getting to the answers. How do you actually evaluate a question? How do you look for answers? How do you dig them out? So that's what you're supposed to pay attention to. This is not just, oh, we'll do two passages. Here are the answers and you're done with that. You won't get these passages in the exam. The aim is to bring structure to your problem solving process for reading comprehension. That's what we're going to do. First steps first. Here is a passage you have. Now we're going to focus on accuracy before we focus on speed. These, both these passages, we'll be doing seven, eight, nine questions each. You obviously won't get that many questions in the actual exam per passage. 
but as an exercise it's great it saves us time when we're practicing you have take your time you have 5 minutes to read the passage I am back. This is not a very complicated passage. It's pretty straightforward. It's non-fiction. Well, the passage is non-fiction. It's about a fictional book. Let's see what the questions are like and how we figure them out. So the first one, it can be inferred from the passage that the author is likely to live in. Now, it can be inferred this question or this phrase means that the question is asking you to not directly dig out information from the passage but look at clues given in the passage and figure out what is definitely true based on information given in the passage now where could we possibly get this information let me see if i can get my pen working this is always tricky and quite embarrassing Yes. Now, if you read the first paragraph carefully, this is the only place the author gives away where he is from. The book was little noticed on your side of the Atlantic. Now, how do we figure the answer? Look nearby. What is the next sentence? 
Collins, which had published the English editions of F. Scott Fitzgerald's first two novels, rejected it outright, and the Chateau and Windus edition failed to arouse much enthusiasm when it was published in London in 1926. So when he's talking about your side of the Atlantic, and he's talk then he's talking about London, he's explaining himself, that means that London should be your side of the Atlantic. Therefore, the author should be from the US. Let's keep reading still to be sure about this. To be fair, the novel hadn't been a smash hit in the States the year before. So now this confirms it. What is he doing in this sentence? First, he says it flopped in London. To be fair means he is now conceding a point. So what he's saying here is it also flopped in the States when it was launched. And then it flopped in London. So therefore, he is saying that your side of the Atlantic, which is London, was where it flopped later. But to be fair, it also flopped on our side. So therefore, the author is likely to be living in the United States of America. There is one other very obvious way to look at it. Look at the options. Options B, C and D. C says in London. Fair enough, so the author could be in London. But if he's in London, he or she, if the author is in London, isn't the author also in the United Kingdom? And before Brexit happened in Europe. So therefore, either the answer has to be A or it has to be B, C and D because if the author is in London. And he couldn't be elsewhere in the United Kingdom because no such thing is mentioned. Dover or Kent or anywhere is not mentioned. Germany is not mentioned. The only two places that are mentioned are London and the US. So you because you need to have only one, one answer, the answer has to be A. One is because we figured out from the passage itself. And secondly, you can eliminate all the other options. Because if the author is in London, the author is also in the United Kingdom and, and in Europe. This is pre-Brexit as an example. So therefore, the answer has to be A for multiple reasons. Keep these things in mind. Eliminating these options is very important. So now, as I said, you also need to be able to tell why the other answers are wrong. So since we've discussed this line, the book was little noticed on your side of the Atlantic in London is wrong. And therefore, it can't, he can't be elsewhere in the United Kingdom because no other place is mentioned. Can't be elsewhere in Europe because no other place is mentioned. Therefore, the other answers are wrong. Second question. Spend a minute looking at it. Which of the following can be inferred from the passage as being true? Once again, which of the following can be inferred? So it's possible that the information is not stated directly in as many words, but there are enough clues which make the answer very, very obvious. Again, there can, can be only one right answer. A. Scott Fitzgerald has had achieved fame in his lifetime as a successful author of international repute. Where can we figure out in the passage whether this answer is right or wrong? Saying he had achieved fame. Look at the sentence. When Fitzgerald died in obscurity in Hollywood 15 years later. He died in obscurity. He died not famous. So he was not famous during his lifetime. and especially international repute. His books were little, little noticed on your side of the Atlantic as we discussed in the previous question. Therefore, A is definitely false. B. In the 1920s, The Great Gatsby, the book was appreciated both by the critics in the US and the critics in London, but failed to achieve commercial success. Where can we find this? Again in the first paragraph. And the Chateau and Windows edition failed to arouse much enthusiasm 
critical or commercial no we do not have a scenario where the where a book flopped commercially but was a critical success no this did not get any major reaction either critical or commercial therefore a is wrong b is wrong c it often happens in literature that a book becomes an astounding success after the death of its author this is true in this example he died in obscurity and then the book became really really famous but to say it often happens in literature can we extrapolate no remember there is no scope for ambiguity we are not allowed to extrapolate unless the author himself mentions that in the passage that in this case this happened and often happens then yes but the author does not say that it often happens he just gives one example therefore this is not the answer d the great gatsby is not as impressive when adapted to stage as it is in prose now this is the only option left we've checked off a b and c but still we need to prove and figure out why this is right let's read it again the great gatsby is not as impressive when adapted to stage as it is in prose where can we find this <laughs> second paragraph so the first one is talking about the critical and commercial reception the second one now talks about how important this book has become and now read and yet all the attempts to adapt it to stage and screen have only served to illustrate its fragility and its flaws sorry i have no i have a graphic tablet and even with that this is the best straight line i can draw geometry is not my thing yet all the attempts to adapt it to stage have only served to illustrate its fragility and its flaws so attempts to adapt it to stage haven't really worked well so adaptation to stage has not been easy or impressive also the prose somehow elevates a lurid and underdeveloped narrative to the level of myth so these two sentences say that stage adaptations haven't been very impressive and the prose itself is very impressive therefore option d which says it's not as impressive when adapted to stage as it is in prose is absolutely correct d is the right answer now of course we spent a lot of time on this question as we were discussing it for now take the time if you're not doing a timed test if you're just doing practice exercises take the time to go through each option very carefully why is it wrong why is it wrong why is it right depending on the answer of course this is very important focus on building your accuracy first be very clear of why an answer is right or wrong it will take you much longer as you keep practicing the speed will come once you practice 30 40 passages the speed will come and you'll be much faster and you'll be much surer of yourself depending on the exam if it if it's an adaptive exam like gmat you need to be very sure of yourself so that you don't get into a panic as the questions get tougher that confidence level is very important as you're proceeding through the exam because if you're nervous about the last few answers you're not sure it's affecting your mood for the rest of the exam you're likely to be very unsure of yourself <clears throat> and you could go into panic you could get very nervous and start making mistakes silly mistakes big mistake next question the most suitable substitute for the word obscurity as used in the passage now what does obscure mean if you know great you already know the answer if you don't he died in obscurity many of the copies were gathering dust which means he didn't sell very many copies when he was alive which means he wasn't his books didn't work very well likely to mean that he's not very famous you can't be sure of this if you don't know the meaning of the word but you can get a hint condition of being rich but unknown now money is not talked about anywhere how much money he made so again if you know the answer already if you know the meaning of the word you already have the answer this is wrong 
but if you have no clue about what the word means money is not mentioned unknown is the answer famous cannot be it because if he were famous like look at the sentence and yet many of the 23000 copies were gathering dust they weren't sold so he was not famous dissatisfaction we have no clue about we haven't been told what was his state of mind over the last few years the answer is b condition of being unknown that's what obscure means fourth read the question it can be inferred that the reason why the great gatsby the book did not do well in the 1920s where are the 1920s discussed he died in obscurity in hollywood 15 years later therefore the 20s are over after that it became really really big so the 1920s are only discussed in the first paragraph does the book talk about any does the book talk about the plot or any flaws and this is more important has the author built any relationship established any cause and effect between the success or failure of the book and any particular reasons for the success or failure the author has definitely said that the book was not a success till way after his death now okay in the second paragraph i see this word flaws attempts to adapt it to stage have served to illustrate its fragility and its flaws the prose somehow elevates the book has the author said anywhere about success or failure in the 20s and the reasons for it no in the first paragraph he just talks about the fact that the book was not a success so therefore keep in mind even if firstly plot flaws are not mentioned the book flaws are mentioned plot flaws are not mentioned this is flaws in its plot even if it's if it had said it had several flaws this cannot be the answer because read the question again this is where seeming ambiguity comes in but if you're feeling that look i saw this in the uh, in the passage read the question again what is the author actually asking it can be inferred that the reason why the book did not do well therefore the for this to be right the author would have had to say the book did not do well because of because it had several flaws or because it had several flaws in the plot it does not say that it does not draw a cause and effect relationship therefore a is wrong b it was too slim a book to be liked by the general public it does not again establish any cause and effect between the size of the book i'm just wondering if the size is mentioned anywhere at all no no size is not mentioned and no cause and effect has been built b is wrong therefore if a is wrong b is wrong obviously both a and b has to be wrong the answer is neither a nor b there is no causal relationship established between the success or failure of the book and any reasons for it therefore eh, d fifth how does gatsby win daisy's love read where is the plot actually discussed look at the start of the third paragraph in its barest outline the great gatsby is a love story very likely this paragraph is going to talk about the plot because it says it's a love story how does he win daisy's heart gatsby wins daisy's heart and her promise oh sorry sorry previous sentence or rather same sentence implying that his background i am getting better at drawing straight lines implying that his background and circumstances are similar to her 
own Gatsby wins Daisy's heart and her promise to wait for him. Background and circumstances. So implying that they have similar backgrounds could be the right answer. Implying that their circumstances are similar. Both are given to you. Though therefore individually this is wrong, this is wrong. If this had said something else, implying that they're uh, 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 implying that their interests are similar then A would have been the right answer because backgrounds is mentioned. But since both have been mentioned, the answer has to be both A and B. If neither obviously does not work. So your answer is C. Read all options. This is why it's so important. You could theoretically just read the first option C. Oh yeah, this is given. Mark it and move on. But no, you would be wrong. You have to read all options. Here C is the right answer. Sixth, it can be inferred from the passage that Daisy marries Tom Buchanan instead of Jay Gatsby because read the, the question and the options. Think of the answer. Now, if you're just moving on from the fifth question, look at the last line. Promise to wait for him, but as the months of his deployment drag on, her devotion wavers. What does this tell you? He had won her heart and, her, and she promised to wait for him, but as the months of his deployment drag on. This is the only thing that's given to you. Yes, it is mentioned that Tom Buchanan was obscenely wealthy. This is where ambiguity comes in. I will repeat that. When you feel that multiple options for a particular question have been mentioned in the passage, read the question. It can be inferred that she marries him instead of Jay Gatsby because what is the potential reason? As the months of his deployment drag on her de devotion wavers. It doesn't say as she realizes how obscenely wealthy Tom Buchanan is, her devotion wavers. It says as the months drag on, her devotion wavers. Obscenely wealthy is mentioned but not mentioned as a reason. She realized that Gatsby had lied to her about their background being similar. We are not given anything of the sort in the passage. Wrong. Not mentioned. She did not expect Gatsby's deployment to continue for so long. Yes. As the months of his employment dra deployment rather drag on, her devotion wavers. This is the right answer. But let's read D anyhow, very important. She was under pressure from Tom to marry her. Sorry about that. She was under pressure from Tom to marry him. Are we given that? No. No such thing mentioned in the passage. Therefore, this is the wrong answer. The answer is C. Seventh. The novel Dash in the summer of 1922. This is a tense question. Gatsby has himself become rich. If you've been through the tenses class, when do you use present perfect when you're leading up to something that's happening? When something has recently happened and leads up to something in the present. This is narration. It's written in present tense. Therefore, this will be simple present. The novel opens in the summer of 1922. It can't be opened because you can't use simple present, oh sorry, you can't use simple past and then follow it up with present perfect. Gatsby has himself become rich and bought a splendid house directly across the bay. The novel opens in the summer of 1922. 
A is the right answer, not this. It can't be has opened, has himself. That's not how narration works. Is opening definitely not. It. It can be inferred from the passage that Scott Fitzgerald died in. Where do you think now that you get the answer? Where is the history mentioned? The point is now not just to find the answer, but to jump straight back to a specific point in the passage, to a specific paragraph where you think it's likely to be. This is how you save time after practice. You've read the passage so well in the first reading, not to remember the facts, not to memorize them, but to know where things are likely to be, where to go back to. If you have to read the whole passage to figure out his, figure out, you know, ages and stuff and timelines, then you're spending a minute reading this passage again after every question. It doesn't work. Where is the history mentioned? If you remember earlier, we discussed he died in obscurity. When? 15 years later. 15 years from when? In 1925. Therefore, your answer is 1925 plus 15, which is 1940. Let's move on to the next passage. Keep in mind these tricks to speed up. You need to know when, oh, sorry, you need to know where to go back to in the passage. Keep in mind that answers cannot be ambiguous. They don't, there has to be one correct answer. There can be no debate about that. Keep in mind that first you should focus on accuracy and then get down to focusing on speed. Speed will come with practice. Don't sacrifice accuracy at the cost of speed. Keep in mind that you should not be skimming passages. It won't work. It will hamper, hamper your accuracy and it will slow you down. Actually, skimming versus thorough reading you might think that I can skim in a minute and thorough reading takes me five minutes, six minutes. Firstly, your thorough readings will become faster with practice. I can guarantee that. Secondly, if you're just skimming, A, your accuracy will go down. B, your confidence will go down because you won't be very sure of the answer. And C, your speed will also go down because if you're thoroughly reading it, reading the passage, you can automatically answer a couple of questions, inference type questions without going back. Secondly, if you're skimming, you will have to go and read the whole passage again. And you'll be doing a faster reading in a minute. If you find it great, if you don't, you'll be doing an even faster reading in 30 seconds, etc., etc. You can't afford that. Do not skim passages. Do a thorough reading. It will definitely guaranteed help you. Next passage, you have five minutes to read.
and I'm back. This is a slightly trickier passage because of the topic. That was a the first one was rather simple in terms of describing the history and the story of a book. This is more sociology. This is more film. This is more getting into people's heads, their thought process, their movie making process, etc., etc. Still not all that complicated, but slightly trickier. Let's see the questions. First one. The phrasal verb game to, as used in the first para. Now this is idiomatic usage. If you know it, that's great. And this is not a very tricky one. Game to means is willing to. I'm game to try that. I'm happy to try that. I'm willing to try that. I'm okay with trying that. Where is it in the passage? Is game to give it a go. It's difficult defining cult films. Now we look at the context, if you don't know the meaning. It's difficult defining cult films. This man has written a book on a hundred cult films. Therefore, he is definitely considering it okay. Or not, not, he's definitely not, he definitely does not have a problem with it. So he's not casual about it is not interested to now we're left with if you don't know the meaning of this idiom is willing to and is considering to he's written a book so he's not considering it second question according to the author of the passage one of the criteria which makes a cult film is I'm going to give you 30 seconds on this one. This is a tricky one. Why is this tricky? Criteria for cult films. What are the criteria that we're given that make a cult film? The cult genre squeezes cultures underbelly to extremes, pushes all the right buttons. Violating propriety, evoking nostalgia. See the problem? Option A says pushing all the right buttons. Option B says evoking nostalgia. Being fantasy fiction, I don't see anywhere. So which one do you pick? A or B? There's no option saying A and B. So it has to be one of them. One has to be wrong. How do you go about this? This is where the ambiguity comes in. What is the solution? Read the question even more carefully. According to the author of the passage. The first one, pushing all the right buttons. Dr. Mathais. I hope that's how you pronounce his name. This is Dr. Mathais defining it. This is a person quoted by the author of the passage. This is not according to the author of the passage. This is according to a person quoted by the author of the passage. This one, evoking nostalgia also fits the bill. This is not a quote in the passage. The author of the passage does not say so and so also says that movies that evoke nostalgia fit the bill. This is the author himself talking. The question says according to the author of the passage, therefore A is wrong. A is Dr. Mathai's view. Evoking nostalgia is the author's view. Fantasy fiction is not given. B is correct, therefore it cannot be D. That is your answer. 
whenever you get confused between two options look at the question more carefully the scope for ambiguity is actually zero third question Dr. Mathai's research into cult films should not come as a surprise. Where are we talking about his research into cult films and surprises being mentioned? Come straight to the last paragraph. To those who know him, his research should not come quite as a surprise. Into cult films? Yes, the passage is about cult films. Dr. Mathai's has been quoted talking about cult films. Therefore, yes, research into cult films. Now what have we given? Read the sentence again. Prohibited from actually renting movies as a boy, he could only look longingly at the posters. So it makes it seem, the passage makes it seem like it should not be a surprise because he was always interested in the posters. He couldn't actually see the movies. Let's look at the options. As a child, he was thrilled by the melodrama and magnificence of posters. Melodramic, uh, melodramic, melodramatic. Magnificent posters. So both words fit. A feeling which he now finds in cult films. This is very likely to be the answers, uh, answer, but we will keep reading on and check all the options. So we're going to come back to this. He has been interested in movies since childhood. Are we given that? He couldn't actually rent movies. He might have still been interested in them, even though he couldn't watch them. But we aren't told that in the passage. Therefore, B is wrong. He has written books earlier to on understanding of cult cinema. Is that given as a reason for why his research into cult films should not come as a surprise? No. Is the reason for his research not coming as a surprise is mentioned only in the last paragraph. The last paragraph does not talk about earlier books. He works in the film studies departments and again, even if he does, it's not mentioned in the last paragraph. We have to build cause and effect. It should not be a surprise because the answer is not D, the answer is A. Now we know the exact reason why A is correct and we know the reason why B, C and D are wrong. This is what will bring you confidence. Even if you know that A is correct but you are unsure about one of the other options, you will not feel confident about your answer as you move on to the next question. To be, to be confident you need to be, and of course, to have great accuracy, you need to be sure that the others are wrong. Will it slow you down? Yes. Will it slow you down a lot? No, not after you've done plenty of practice. You'll keep getting faster at this. And it's very important for now as you build your accuracy to go through all options and know for sure why one option is wrong and one is correct or three options are wrong and one is correct. Next question, it can be inferred from the passage inference question, something might not specifically be mentioned word for word, but is true based on facts given in the passage. Let's again look at the options and see where we can find them. 100 cult films is the first in-depth academic book on cult cinema. There's where it's first mentioned. The book is a follow up of sorts to his earlier effort, Cult Cinema and Introduction, which was described as the first in depth. Oh, there's your answer right there. First in depth academic examination of all aspects. For which book? Cult cinema. Not for 100 cult films, therefore this is wrong. Cult cinema and introduction was a bestseller. Are we told about the sales? Cult cinema and introduction is mentioned in the second paragraph. Are we told about sales of the book? Third paragraph onwards, we just move on to the genre. This book is only discussed. This particular book is only discussed in the second paragraph. Are we told about sales? No. Should we think that, oh, this is a follow up because the first book must have been a success? No. Stick to specifics, stick to, stick to what you're given.
100 cult films has been released very recently 100 cult films what all are we given about this so this book is only mentioned in the first paragraph except for saying that it's a follow up of sorts which is given in the second paragraph but otherwise so what are we given about the book hot off the press is this book 100 cult films what does hot off the press mean it literally means it's just been released Okay, my laptop's about to die, so I'm going to be quick with the last two questions. Which of the following is not mentioned as a cult movie in the passage? Unchi and Andalu, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. The 1928 film. Yes, is mentioned as a cult film. The question is which is, which is not mentioned, so therefore this is wrong. Star Wars. Other mainstream films that can be seen, seen as cult, Star Wars, not the answer. Rocky Horror Picture Show, pushing all the right buttons, squeezing cultures under belly to extremes is given here. Salvador Dali is mentioned where, even if you don't know him. The film was made by these two. So he's not a film, he's a guy. He is not mentioned as a cult movie, this is the answer. Six, an example of violation of sense of propriety in a cult movie. Such movies may violate a sense of propriety because the viewer is yanked. So consider, so here he's giving an example of a movie violating a sense of propriety. The movie is Unshi and Andalu. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is an important line, infamous for its apparent slicing. Wherein a fellow desperately pulls across an apartment room two grand pianos carrying live priests and dead donkeys. This is the example he's giving. Why am I specifying this part of the sentence? Because look at the options. This is a tricky question. This is a, an ambiguous question, but it's actually not. What is an example? The pushing of right buttons in the Rocky Horror Picture Show? No. Pushing all the right buttons is Rocky Horror Picture Show is given as an example of pushing all the right buttons. I'm speeding up because my battery is about to die. The apparent slicing of an eyeball. This is the tricky part. But this is the wrong answer. Why? Because this is the sentence is given as a as an example for why the movie is infamous, not on how the movie is violating sense of propriety or yanking people out of normality. Therefore, this is the wrong answer. This is just why is the movie infamous. Dorothy is irrelevant because we are talking about a specific movie. A fellow desperately pulling across an apartment room two grand pianos is the example for violation of sense of propriety in a cult movie. There is no ambiguity here. This is the right answer. So that's all for this session. We'll come back with more practice sessions. In the meanwhile, visit our website prepco.online. Got a bunch of test series coming up soon. Uh, and yes, you can follow all of it. You can see all our videos there. Subscribe to our channel and click on the bell. You'll see notifications like this video to really help us. If you dislike this video, I won't like you very much. And see you soon for the next class with more practice sessions. See you guys. Bye.